thinking about kind of supporter communication, supporter email, within many organizations, there is no kind of coherent supporter journey at all. You know, different communications go out at different times. Is that something that, that people here in the room? Yeah, fine. There's lots of nodding there, fair enough. So that's kind of ends up being a little bit of an issue of communications just happening across the organization at, at random times. Another, another area is you kind of often find out that maybe one part of the organization, maybe the fundraising or campaigns, have created a supporter journey that works for their, their group of supporters, maybe their own list or their group of supporters, but that's not kind of joined up across the rest of the organization. So um, again, that, that can cause various challenges. And then the other, the other issue can be um, something that I've come across a lot of times is, is people know they really want to have a supporter journey. They really want a clear supporter journey, but they really struggle to work out who should get which emails, when and how, and how to segment the data accordingly. And um, that, again, another challenge particularly uh, that I've come across a lot of times. So those are three particular issues around email and, and online and offline communication as well. And the other couple of things, one relating to campaigns and one relating to fundraising, probably things that, again, you may have come across sometimes is quite often um, when I've worked with organisations, there's a particular tactic people are desperate to do but haven't necessarily worked out. Is that the right tactic that will deliver the the campaign objectives that you want. So one example, and I don't mean this specific campaign action, it's just the one example I could find of it, is incorporating interactive maps into stuff and then thinking that people then go from playing with an interactive map on to doing something like writing to their MP, for instance. Is that the right way to maximise the number of people communicating their MP? Sometimes it might be, sometimes it might not be. But sometimes the tactic ends up being chosen before, the, before uh, whether that will actually meet the objective. And the last... Uh, example I'm just going to mention quickly something I've come across a few times is where working with fundraisers um, and I, I'm really interested in linking campaigning and fundraising together within the organization and quite often come across you know one of the one of the opportunities is really engaging supporters in an organization's work and encouraging them to donate more is by getting them involved in campaigns but I've seen this is an example from Three different organisations I've seen do this in the last year. You get brand new supporters recruited from Care2, Change.org, somewhere like that, and they get the following six emails. Within six weeks, please donate £25. Please donate £25. Read our lovely blog post, PS, please donate £25. Please donate £25. Please donate £25. And here's another blog post, and PS, please donate £25. And I've seen <coughs> several examples of that from organisations recently. And Basically, you know, that isn't a great supporter journey, um, but, at least, <laughs> but at least it's a series of emails to a new group of supporters. Back over to Amber. Yeah, okay, so when we were looking at all the different problems that both of us faced, and, and a lot of you have been nodding along and laughing along, like, we, we understand these problems. We're trying to think about what are the common principles or what are the emerging issues across all of these, and um, sort of come up with three ways that they all relate to integration problems. Um, so the first one is, sometimes the supporter journey doesn't see a supporter as a whole person. Um, and a whole person that has full capability to decide how they would like to engage with a campaign. An, an actual person in reality who, would, who can make decisions for themselves about how they in, engage with campaigns. Um, and that leads to, uh, or, or the alternative is seeing them as a segment or a target and not integrating their needs and their desires into your plans. Um, and not thinking about who they are. Um, so the, in, the integration of supporters' needs and segments of supporters' needs with each other and, and with the organisational goals. So the next one is um, perhaps more often than not, organisations work in silos and each silo has their own culture, they, it has their own demands, their own needs, their own thoughts and desires about the way the world should work um, and that makes integration hard and, and especially around a supporter journey where this is like the pinnacle of where they all have to interact with the same people in the outside world. Um, so yeah, I mean, Glenn's example of fundraising with campaigners and, and the needs to integrate there. Um, and the final one was tactics and objectives. And uh, yeah, I think that this can happen, the lack of integration happens between tactics and um, objectives or strategy, particularly because just sometimes day to day, you, you just forget what the strategy is. The strategy isn't built into the process. Um, 
and I think that that was like the example of using interactive maps or for a while it was thunderclap and it was just like oh look there's this thing let's use it brilliant and not really considering where that comes in and I think with this used to being called the e-campaigning forum but that, that really comes about around digital tools um, but it's not just new exciting tools sometimes it's old tools like emails we just that's what we do right let's do emails or Facebook that's what people do let's do that and, and not thinking about how that fits in with the strategy. Um, so all of this bad integration <coughs> leads to a fragmented supporter journey. And that's not good for organizations who could have more effective retention rates. They could have better impact on, on the change that they're trying to see in the world. And um, it's also a problem for the citizens who are trying to engage in their most effective way and seeing the potential of, of citizens and supporters. Um, there are a few tools out there already looking at parts of these problems. And there's tools that we've all seen and, and used. And so we're gonna, that was, we felt like, well, rather than creating something new, let's go and consider what's already been done before repeating it all. So Glenn's gonna look at some of these now. So one example of that is a couple of examples here of things that the Greenpeace Mobilization Lab have put together. So this is an example of kind of creating open campaigns, for example, and kind of going through your, your campaign and, and kind of placing it on, um, on a scale for, for these different six different things. So for example, who is going to initiate the campaign? Is it staff or is it people out there in the world? Who's going to uh, make decisions? Is it centralised decision making, distributed decision making and so on and so forth? So that, that is a really interesting way of developing the strategy behind the campaign, but it doesn't necessarily then very easily translate into something that can create um, a, a long-term sort of supporter journey. Um, if you're interested in this, we'll, we'll obviously share the slides and links to some of these resources as well, because there's, there's some really interesting things out there. And another example is, I'm sure everyone's seen some kind of engagement pyramid, ladder of engagement. This is, a, again, this is from Mobilization Lab, and it's, again, a particularly good example of it because of the way they, they sort of consider some of the different actions that people might do here, as well as the metrics of how you might go about measuring that. So, for example, someone who's in the, in the following section here, they might be reading and watching Greenpeace communications they've got there, and you might measure that by um, people who are active email subscribers and things like that. So there's, there's different ways of measuring some of that stuff, and, and that breaks it down into a lot more kind of levels of engagement than you often see with these, with these things. But again, it doesn't, it doesn't do that full job of taking it all the way to kind of how you can then translate that into something that can actually help move people up that ladder of engagement necessarily. Um, now, another thing I'll mention quickly is the Common Cause Foundation. I think someone mentioned earlier about the kind of, the, it might have been Nikki who mentioned that earlier about the sort of the values and frames uh, work that they've, they've been doing. And one of the things that they put together was this toolkit. Now, they, they sort of say that communications that you do should ideally have kind of a series of outcomes and work across all of your target audiences. And of course, this is a really important sort of area of work that they're looking at in terms of the sort of intersectionality of different campaigning issues and all of that, uh, kind of bringing everything together. But as they say themselves, this is an idealized and perhaps ultimately unattainable goal, a communication that literally works for every possible audience to deliver every possible outcome. And I would think that's, that's an understatement. That's genuinely <laughs> not possible to deliver every possible outcome with one single communication. So while that's a helpful way of thinking about different audiences and objectives, you literally cannot do that in the real world. So it's not, it's not necessarily usable in formulating an, uh, you know, a, a journey. It's useful thinking about the entire journey for a supporter potentially, but not perhaps an individual communication within that. And then the next thing we wanted to talk about is, is kind of the thing that's most influenced perhaps our thinking in terms of planning supporter journeys, which is kind of design and particularly user-centered design. So one of the things we originally used as the title of this was just this particular section of this presentation, which is uh, looking at the Sydney Opera House. Now, the Sydney Opera House was designed by uh, Arup. Um, I can't remember exactly which year now, but the idea behind it was that it would only be a successful project. There was a lot of innovation going on here. You know, they created an entire new way of building buildings using concrete and cement. But they, they, they only considered the Sydney Opera House to be a success as a building if it delivered for the audience. It had to have great acoustics, had to be easy for people to get around, easy for people to get to, and all of that kind of thing. So seeing it as a, as a collected entity, it, was, was, it wasn't a judge a success just by being a pretty building. 
the sort of tactic, if you like, as a success if it actually delivered the objectives that it set out to achieve. And so this is, a, this is an example. For example, I don't know if you've seen this, but this was the kind of um, when, uh, when Arup as a company think go, go about kind of designing a building that they want, obviously part of it is to look as an attractive building. To, but it has to do all of these things. It has to, very first, it has to have a purpose. It has to be stable, not fall down. <laughs> you know, you have to consider all of these elements and only then does that, all that feed into the design at the very end. So it's that kind of thinking about all of these other elements that come in before thinking about the tactics at the end. And so I guess we sort of synthesise that down into thinking particularly about the kind of the purpose, the organisation, the resources available, the audience, and then taking that down to the design of communications at the very end. So all this is very theoretical background, but we just wanted to give you that kind of overview of the kind of process we've gone through to kind of be th through thinking about all of this. Yeah, and particularly as, as I said at the start, because we're still in this phase where we're like, cool, so does this work? Does this make sense? And um, that's why the idea of taking you through the journey so that you also know where we've come from to get here in case that this bit doesn't make any sense, which is what did, what's the solution? Um, so all of these, none of them really for us helped with particularly the integration side of the strategy, like how you create a strategy that works across fundraising and comms and, and everyone, and that works with your supporters and that work, and particularly because a lot of them are like really specific tools that have really specific language for fundraisers or language for campaigners or language for, so none of them really addressed something that was like non-technical language, a non-technical approach that could, you could just get anyone in a room to talk about what you're doing. Um, and then once you've created that strategy, none of them also created something that was like, it was like, okay, so now we've got this tool for you. And I remember Supporter Journeys, the, when we first talked about this, the, um, someone had just come up to me and been like, it's not about Supporter Pyramids, or it's not about this triangle. First we've got pyramids, but now it's actually helixes. We need helixes now. <laughs> and I was like, that's great for your organization, but it, it's not it's not going to work every time. And that was the point. You've got all these tools and they're not going to work every time. So how do you have a tool that, that anyone can just engage with and then create implementation plan that always works? That's, that was our aim. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, our solution uh, is around this idea of a supporter engagement for everyone. And I'm, I'm, I won't say too much here because Glenn's going to take us through it, but um, the main point was to use... I mean, this was probably because of the wine, but I think it was a useful thing that we wanted to think about this really simply. And we're just like, how about the question words? Let's just look at the questions you ask and just take these really simple words and, and that's all you need for a framework. And we found that, it, that, that that is how it works. So um, Glenn's just going to show us how that connects to some of the more technical ideas, but then taking it back, showing how it works for an example. Before I do that, I just yeah. think it's worth mentioning the open space session that we had this morning mm -hmm. where uh, looking at uh, data and actually it was very interesting how there were different groups of people with slightly different challenges and then but what, what someone first said to, to kind of try and work out the solution to kind of discussing this, someone said, so actually we've got two issues here, we've got a what and a how and it was really interesting how it just it kind of rem reminded for me actually that that is a very it sounds very basic and straightforward but ultimately that is how people engage with sort of breaking down these complex issues is asking very simple questions and then you can develop something much more complex from asking that simple question so i'm just going to work through an example here to show and i'm sure many people here have worked on campaign strategies that, ha that are going to end up this is going to be an example of, of essentially looking at a campaign strategy. But what we're going to look at is then how you would turn that campaign strategy using the same set of questions and the same framework into a supported journey is essentially what we're, what we're going to try and show you how we've used it at least. And it might be that you, well, hopefully you'll see potential other uses for it or ways that we can add to it really. So by asking the sort of the why question, and this is thinking about from a, initially from a campaign planning perspective, campaign strategy perspective, let's use that. So you're, you're, first of all, you're asking, the, the first question with anything needs to be why, what's, what's the outcome you're looking for and what are, are there any other organisational needs that need to be delivered through this? Which kind of relates to the purpose element of the design kind of design thinking framework. And then the what. What tools do you have available to achieve that? What needs to happen? That kind of relates to the resources. Who, 
who needs to be involved to bring about the change that you're looking for? What are their needs? That kind of relates to the organization and the audience. And how, what are the tactics you're going to use, last of all, which needs to incorporate all of the things that have come above that. I'm sure to most people here that's probably not particularly different from the way you've thought about campaigns, com planning a campaign strategy in the past. And obviously the when and the where, additional elements that are kind of related, related to that, that particularly related to the, camp to the tactics that come on from the bottom there. Does this all make sense to everyone so far? Good. So here's a worked example of how Clean Water Action California in used, used this as a kind of a test internally last year. So they were working on a campaign last year around the plastic bag ban in California. Has, does everyone know a little bit about that? So uh, back in, I think it was 2015, uh, the state of California had banned plastic bags, but then due to lobbying from the plastic bag industry, it was, it was delayed heavily and there had to be a vote from, from, I think it was the end of last year, November, December time, there was a vote, um, it was sort of a, a referendum essentially from people living in California. And so they wanted to, they wanted to do some work around this. And they had different parts of the organisation wanted to use this as an opportunity to kind of have a big protest, a big sort of protest campaign. There were others who saw, well, this could be an opportunity to get lots of media coverage, other people as an opportunity to recruit lots of supporters, others for fundraising. So how to bring all of that together was something that they were really struggling with being able to do with this sort of short time frame campaign. And so they went through this of kind of thinking step by step. Why are they doing this campaign? They want to stop the industry lobbying against the plastic bag ban, which is the sort of big picture thing. But then for the organisation, they want to use this as an opportunity to recruit new supporters. Ultimately, that was what their reason for running the campaign was. What needed to happen, the state government needed to see that the ban on plastic bags was popular with voters. So ultimately, people need to vote in favour of that ban again. Who needs to be involved in that? Well, clean water action supporters needed to be involved. The plastic bag manufacturers were going to be involved in some way. Consumers and the state government obviously involved. How is it going to happen? Well, these were the tactics that they wanted to use. They wanted to have an online petition. They wanted to get people sending in, at some point, <coughs> plastic bags themselves to be able to use them offline as part of their protest. So that, that would kind of, kind of move the sort of online to offline kind of thing, have that kind of visible representation of people who've taken part in the campaign. And they obviously wanted to have the in-person protest. And that needed to happen at the end of last year, and it was going to happen online on their website, through email, Facebook, and a protest in South Carolina, which is where the plastic bag manufacturing companies were based. So that all seems fairly straightforward in terms of developing the campaign strategy. But for them, that, that made it really clear that what, what needed to happen. And so what? Turning that into a supported journey is the kind of the next step from this. So what we're sort of saying, and we're, we're the way we, I've certainly found this as a useful way of doing this and being able to get people from across the organisation who've maybe not worked on things like supporter journeys before, is to then think, take that campaign strategy, which everyone's familiar with, that kind of approach of building a strategy where you've got your objectives, your, your goals, your tactics, your timescales, and hopefully the metrics that will show whether it was a success or not. But then you turn that into a supporter journey. And so what we're saying with this is you keep the same kind of your why from your campaign strategy, but then you take your tactics that you've got from the how section here. You take those tactics and then replace the what section here with that. So what needs to happen? You're then taking your specific tactics and then you work through the who and the how, the when and the where based on each individual tactic, which then develops very neatly into a supporter journey that looked like that for them. So why are they doing this in October? They want to recruit new supporters. They're going to do an online petition. They're going to initially target their existing supporters. They're going to ask them to sign the petition and share it with friends. So that will bring in, hopefully, new people. And that's the methods of promotion they're going to use and when they're going to do it. Going into November, that's the objective. They're going to get people who've signed the online petition to send in their plastic bags. It's going to be new and existing supporters. They're going to email them to do that at this particular time using these different channels and then going on into December with the specific actions that are happening there. But what that did was it very, very simply showed people internally who 
from different departments and different teams who had not really thought conceptually about how these things could link together and what order you want to do them in, how that could work. Does that make sense to everyone? Well, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Phew. So what that meant is, like I say, it's a very simplified version of how to think about this. But what that meant was for people who, you know, who are not working on this kind of stuff on a very frequently on a day-to-day -day basis necessarily, being able to use that as a way of very quickly and simply seeing how those different groups of people might be engaged at different points during a campaign, always making sure that it's done for a specific purpose, really helped have that clarity internally. Yeah, so, um, and I think I just wanted to add to that, that like the reason for choosing these like really simple words is it felt a little bit oversimplified at times because it's a bit hard to say what does why mean but as soon as you start defining what does why mean you start using technical language that relates to your purpose and your organ so when you go into the group and you just start with these one word question words you can really keep it at that that level that anyone can engage with what you're trying to achieve there um, I can either, the, the choice is now if you feel like you've followed along and you're like cool I have a problem that that works for we can try it now on this flip chart. Um, and the alternative is, I go through a different example because I used it to help um, in the design of a website. So I can show that example. Is anyone like eager to just get started and send us a problem? Or would you prefer another example? Maybe you can be thinking on an example <laughs> so that when I finish this one, which will only take five minutes, that's your time limit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that when I've got to the end of this one, uh, one of you might have thought of something that, and maybe because you can see like a, a different way that it can be used, it might help. But if it doesn't work, then that's fine as well. <laughs> if you just have questions. Um, so this was for Bankwatch, whose why and purpose, and after examining lots of their materials on their website and across, um, I could work out was to ensure transparency of international financial institu institutions and their activities to prevent harmful impacts of those activities and um, to generate civic participation around that area. So what do they need to do to achieve that? They wanted to create media around it, they wanted to create public awareness, they wanted to do policy and advocacy, advocacy work to change the laws and they also wanted to create mobilisation which was something that they didn't want to this website to achieve that was going to be done through other ways so we could say okay that's not on this on the radar of this one so who are they trying to target uh, it's mostly media and journalists or it's policy-based organizations and individuals and how are they going to do this they're going to present them one with facts that they can use and analysis that that they can take from that and understand so that it's not just it's providing experts with facts but it's also providing people who aren't already in expertise or or journalists with analysis and they're going to do that through short and engaging pieces appropriate for the press because it's for the media um, and again this is how this links to the one before it um, they're going to provide analysis that's timely that there's summaries available and that there's evidence that they can go and find so then the how, again, like breaking it down into the when and where, it's, uh, it's through timely monitoring and press releases. Um, and those have to be in a sort of place that can be seen active and updated regularly. So that's going to impact what it looks like on a website or if they actually should be using a different tool like um, Twitter or, or something where you can see an ongoing update. Um, they need stuff that's short and accessible and a space for analysis and reports so that Again, there's two sections of the website there for, for where you can go to get them. And they also need an archive of evidence, which at, at the time might have been more like around the website, but not in an archive that was easily accessible. But working out why they need that evidence, which is because policy-based organisations use their analysis and need to know that it's based on fact, can set how exactly that that, that was created.